Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Practicing Tactical Solidarities Part 2. I'm Rachel Rakes, the Curator of Public Practice at Bach. The first edition of this roundtable took place in May of this year, uh, when we had begun to remobilize some of Bach's programming efforts in light of the pandemic and related crises. In addition to rethinking our programs in a matter that felt responsive, or that we hoped felt responsive to dispersions of locality and online presence, we started thinking about how to shift the research and resources that we have towards active response uh, in more in support of coordinated grassroots and creative efforts around us, whether in the forms of organizing or redistribu redistribution of time, labor, and goods. Towards that notion, we developed a digital forum entitled Prospections, which merges previous Bach research and enlists ongoing collaborations to think practically and speculatively however we can, uh, along with current urgencies and opportunities around them. Uh, our first focus or our first issue was entitled Tactical Solidarities, and it looks at some previous and new solidarity frameworks to offer other possibilities for lasting, more malleable forms. So this event series came out of that. Um, our first edition hosted groups from across Europe, uh, which were looking at how to pivot their own long-term collective care work into emergency resourcing, such as ensuring people had masks, food, and housing in the immediate aftermath of the lockdown and border closures. Today's event takes a finer focus uh, with groups working in Netherlands, uh, the focus of their own touches, box physical base of the track in particular. Many with us today have also been participating in Bach's Autumn 2020 Fellowship Program, which has uh, taken, which has taken its own emphasis on organizing locally and maintaining proximities over this protracted crisis moment. I'm really happy to bring together in conversation several collectives and cooperatives who have been doing this work, uh, who've been thinking, taking what they've, the structures that they already had in place uh, beyond the immediate, beyond only filling in gaps, uh, and enacting mutual aid and maintaining strong communities uh, for the future. Today's guests represent a wide, a wide range of organizations and organizational tactics. Uh, I'm happy to be here in the service of furthering those connections and uh, also with those of you who are listening from the live stream. So we'll start off hearing from each of our guests uh, just to give an introduction of what they have been doing, a little bit about the organization or often organizations uh, they've been working with for quite some time and how those, how those uh, different urgencies and organizations have been changing in this time and also looking towards how to build coalition and strengthen rural and local communities for the future. Um, before we start with that, um, I'll mention that uh, we'll be listening in on the on any of the streams. If you have any comments or questions, please put, feel free to put them there. And one last thing I'll say is, uh, if anyone in the audience would like to share efforts from your own locale or network, um, please go ahead and offer them as well. It's always nice to keep building this. So with that, um, I'm going to start out uh, with Shai Raviv and Anna Wright from the Warhammer, who are going to give you an intro to the work they've been doing um, over time and especially right now. And um, as I said, each of the groups will give a brief presentation and then we'll get into a broader conversation. So um, Shai and Anna, if you could take it away. Yeah. Hello. Good evening. Good and strange to be here. Uh, I followed the first uh, edition of this roundtable discussion uh, some months ago, and it seems like a really long time ago, and, and now we are again in second uh, lockdown day in the Netherlands. Uh, my name is Shai. I'm one of the co-founders of the Voorkamer, which is a meeting, a cultural meeting space in Utrecht uh, in the neighborhood Lombok. Uh, we work with people from diverse backgrounds uh, with a strong emphasis on uh, newcomers, communities, uh, migrants with refugee background, uh, residenting in the, as it's a, uh, in the asylum seeker center nearby where we are uh, located, but also people who are already um, in, with their own uh, house. And uh, the way the forecomer operates is by looking for ways to um, co-create the space and the content with the community itself. So to put that in context, um, it's not that we have uh, volunteers and 
audience and target group and and receivers and and and, and givers but we kind of co-create and um, make the space by and for the people who actually inhabit it and that could be from physical artifacts um, making of the space um, to making of the program um, so the work we do is based on uh, project groups uh, with different uh, people that kind of together think what do we want to do what do we need in order to make it happen and uh, who do we want to include in that and our role as an organization is to uh, enable and facilitate and, and guide that uh, with whatever uh, that means um, and I'm not here alone today I'm uh, here together with Anna who is a uh, uh, organizer, uh, volunteer, uh, community builder, and just to kick off a bit uh, the perspectives that we will bring here today, because we are doing many different things at the Forecamer, uh, we brought a couple of images, so I'm gonna um, gently share my screen, uh, just, yeah, so it gets also visual and not only uh, our voices. Um, this image is from uh, oh, now exactly four years ago, actually from opening the space and uh, making it um, with the ambition to fill it up with activities that bring people together uh, based on a one on one interaction. Uh, so we are uh, actually our whole uh, being is based on bringing people in a personal contact with creativity and cultural practices to make that happen. Um, and Anna will be sharing a specific project uh, in the next minute or so, and we will use that also as a way to reflect on the past, on the yeah, on kind of uh, relevant issues of the last months. Anna, yeah, thank you, Shai, for introducing already. Um, I'm Anna. Hi, everyone. Really looking forward to the discussion of today of tactic tactics that we can use um, in these times we live in. Um, I'm indeed a volunteer here in the Forecomer for around a year and a half now. And when I first came to the Forecomer, the space was really full of people. So now after a year and a half, it's strange to see that um, stuff that we organize uh, is quite different and has to have a reduced amount of people inside. But still, we developed some strategies in how we can um, work with that. And in the pictures, you can see one of our um, programs. Uh, it's called Lino uh, Making. We make Linos um, every second Saturday. And it's one of the successful events that we were um, managing to, um, to work with. Also, um, in the time of a hard lockdown, or like those two weeks in October, we were not able to meet. Uh, we developed a strategy of meeting online and distributing the materials uh, to participants so they worked from their homes. Um, so I, I um, realized that we have to be very adaptive in organizing and very quick in reorganizing events, um, uh, especially in times like this, um, and especially in the, in the place such as the Four Camera, like Shai said, is very physical. And um, the big question we have now is how to co-create a space physically um, if we are in a lockdown. But more about that we can also say afterwards for our, our um, other projects. Thank you. Okay, great. We'll take it from there um, with uh, Michi, my happy Saturday, and talk a bit about uh, Mirante Effect. Michi, uh, you got um, to take your mute up. from Migrante Effect and also from the Man Art and Culture Network. And there are lots of uh, organizations here, but I would like to focus on Migrante Effect. And uh, last February, we launched Migrante Effect, and it serves as a local campaign center that will address issues and concerns of migrants and refugees. And uh, it, uh, it also serves as a local campaign center to address um, major Philippine issues, especially those directly affecting Filipino migrants and refugees in the Netherlands, in Europe, and their families back home in the Philippines. Uh, 
this so this is the launch that we had last February and uh, they're trying to fix my orchard can you hear me now is it clear uh, okay so um this is the launch that we had last February this year and um and one objective also of Migrante is to build solidarity with migrant organizations, with other nationalities and peoples in Utrecht and NL, and of course also outside NL. And we fight for rights and welfare of all migrants and refugees uh, uh, in, in other parts of Europe. So when COVID hit, COVID-19 hit, our organizations focus on how to reach out to not only to the members, but also to those who are in need of help and support. So uh, we announce, um, so we announce hotlines where we could uh, reach out to them and if, if they have, um, if they need, and so they, uh, they need us to support them and uh, uh, if there's anything that we could do to help them with their health and other concerns, then they could uh, call these hotlines. And if, when we sent out these hotlines, it really became busy. And so we started having these relief operations. And uh, we also, um, uh, let's see, so we had to form teams that we do the packing of uh, the relief goods. And we also have to contact lawyers for legal aids and doctors for their health concerns. And uh, we also launched Cyber Tapihan um, because we, we felt that there is a need for, uh, for us to provide information because there were a lot of uh, um, news on the internet about COVID and some are not really that accurate. So we need to give them information that are scientific. So uh, we launched this uh, radio program, it's Cyber Behind. And um, so we provided also resources and it was helpful to the migrants, not only uh, for their physical and mental needs, but also uh, we gave out information of, about what's happening uh, in their communities and in the Philippines. So, um, and from cyber that we have, oh, I would like to um, focus on one Here, uh, one, uh, one segment of Cyber Copian was uh, a, when we featured a, an undocumented who survived COVID. And uh, uh, this helped the migrants uh, uh, voice out their anxieties, their problems, and everything. Because uh, this uh, woman, at first, she was really scared to, to get. Um, COVID test because she's undocumented. She, she, she was scared that she would get deported. But then, so she tried her best to just uh, take care of herself. And uh, and people were like discriminating her. And but with the help of the community, she was able to uh, to yeah survive to heal herself. But that was really a very uh, hard journey for her. And uh, and. We also have this, I, sorry for the technicals, because I'm trying to hear. So Cyber Katihan, uh, our, our local radio here in Uche, is, under, is, is part of a big uh, global internet radio program. And this uh, global, Internet radio program called Pinoy Radio Europa. This serves the migrant population outside the Netherlands and outside the Philippines. So that means 10% of our population uh, could uh, easily uh, listen, tune into this radio program. And that would be like 11 million because 10% of our population in the Philippines are migrants. So that's one also. And we also have a A 
okay, for our solidarity. So here uh, we also um, joined or we contributed also to solidarity actions for other, for other migrant communities like International Migrants Association. So we extended solidarity messages and we also had a petition signing. And it says here, I, uh, I it's a bit for the for the support of uh, migrants' rights and displaced um, peoples. And we have fighting the night against COVID and Miguel Obris and, and the for the solidarity of the citizenship of migrants. So um so that's one and we also had uh, we also joined IWA, it's International Women's uh, Alliance. I think uh, 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 Yasmin is part of it and we uh, we took part like joining in their webinars and we also had speakers who participated and also uh, did cultural presentations. And we uh, have this fourth uh, comer. We joined a fourth comer and a fourth comer activity. It's an activity of, I think, uh, yes, activist kitchen in back. And um, and here. We, so we were able to meet other um, migrants from uh, Fort Palmer and we shared uh, recipes and we cooked together. And one here, June is a, uh, uh, yes, uh, he is um, showing them that how to cook Biko. So Biko is a recipe, it's a rice, it's the indigenous rice, cocos milk, sugar, and we could easily relate this to the struggles of the toiling farmers who produce these three agricultural products, but they were, but of course they are among the poorest of the poor in our society. So these are just examples of how we uh, do solidarity work and, um, and of course there's much more in our everyday activities. So here's people. Pardon for, for this, uh, I have been so, and, and down the past. And so we also have a noise barrage. And uh, one example is that we joined, or we supported the noise barrage in France, in Italy, in Spain. And this noise barrage is, uh, is a call for uh, support for, uh, for COVID-19 health assistance and also uh, to house our President Duterte. So, and then this is Pack House. We also have, uh, we do like uh, guesting in um, webinars and talk shows and uh, talk of sort of the struggles of, the, of our people. And, la oh, I'm sorry. This is it. And then for the last part here. So we continuously we continuously do um, mobilizations, mass actions, and uh, this is strengthens our relationship with our other networks and uh, migrant communities. So that's it. Thanks, Vijay. Yeah, thanks. Um, we will turn to. Yeah, look. <laughs> oh, that was so technical. I <laughs> Uh, so we'll turn to uh, Gerardo Gomez Honda and Charlie Harrington from uh, Mutual Support Platform. Yeah. Hey, um, I'm Charlie, and um, I'm speaking not, uh, speaking tonight on behalf of the Mutual Support Platform. Um, and I am a recent graduate of the Master of Fine Art Program at the HKU in Utrecht, which is where. The mutual support platform was formed. Hey, hello. Um, I am Gerardo Gomez Tonda, and I am also speaking on behalf of the mutual support platform. I am also a, a classmate of Charlie, actually, and um, I'm also a recent graduate from the MAFA HKU. So, 
Charlie, would you like to introduce the mutual support? Mm -hmm. So the mutual support platform, um, like I said, was something that began um, within the Master of Fine Art program at the HKU. And it's a space by and for students, alumni, and teachers um, within this program. And it was uh, formed as a response to the pandemic um, as a way of trying to support each other in light of the lack of a care structure that existed within the art academy as an institution. Um, so, and as well, we were trying to create these forms of support, also realizing and acknowledging that um, we were already practicing certain forms of support within our program, um, but then the needs for the support were amplified um, once the pandemic hit. Um, so we have, uh, bef even before the pandemic, we've been working with issues like housing and um, difficulties being a non-EU student um, in regards to visa. Um, and then these things became more needed, more help and assistance and support was needed during the pandemic. Um, and this kind of became the mutual support platform became a structure that kind of moved with us through our graduation. Um, it was started by our class um, that myself, Gerardo, and also Julian Gizem here um, are part of. And it's something that we are continuing to work on um, and wanting to keep growing and bringing in more um, support as well for current students who have not yet graduated, teachers, and also alumni who graduated before us. Yes, that's right. And like uh, uh, Charlie was uh, saying, so this is, um, uh, uh, this has been the, the work of the uh, that we have been doing at the MSP has been uh, circulating around uh, issues of uh, 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 not, uh, non-EU students or like uh, um, so problems with visa and uh, uh, and the relation with uh, with the institutions here on one hand on the other hand uh, thinking about how to how to sustain our practices and um, so together we we sort of uh, uh, started working in this structure that is the MSP that sometimes is is referred to as a as a collective, but it's actually more like a expanded network, or this is how we perceive it at least. Um, which basically, um, so the 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 way that we sort of started working with this structure of uh, expanding network was really reaching out to uh, uh, to alumnix via uh, uh, works, for instance, uh, uh, Ola has a sign uh, has a name, pardon. Um, had also been doing a, a work of tracking and um, and other people as well. And via this, we started also sort of like uh, connecting with uh, with uh, uh, more alumni. And um, so then um, the last, so we we are basically meeting regularly, and we are sort of trying to focus in works of uh, uh, in relation to to how to uh, archive and how to um, sort of. Uh, Keep uh, keep tabs on uh, institutional injustice uh, with students and tutors against the, the institutions like the like the HKU uh, that were really magnified with a with a um, with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, and then issues of uh, housing crisis also um, trying to work with uh, ways of of mapping alumnix so that there is a, a kind of work of uh, strength strengthening this this kind of uh, growing network as a form of uh, supporting each other and then uh, within this within this uh, uh, meetings we have been also sort of coming with uh, with ideas for instance like uh, uh, i think this was from gisem actually which is to 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 making a, a sort of work group around surviving as a non EU student uh, um, in 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 the in pandemic and then um 
And then also uh, there is the share your practice, which is also something we have been working with to to kind of uh, uh, bring our practices together and, and sort of connect in between them. And um, so this is more or less so far. And what we're taking it towards is really thinking about um, so thinking about the potential of the network to facilitate uh, collaborations in every level. So from helping out to organize, uh, working together. And also to, um, I think it's very important for us also to s strengthen the position of the, uh, of the students, uh, the, the MAFA students, also in relation to institutions like uh, also governmental, and also together with the, with the housing crisis, because this has been also a huge issue with the non-international announcements in the, in the offerings, uh, uh, in the availability of studios and, and such. And, uh, and also, I think, um, and well, so I think it's, a, it's also like a, a pedagogical, it has a pedagogical potential of connecting the practices and collectives also as, uh, as a way with, uh, um, yeah, of getting, getting stronger together. <laughs> so, do you want to add something, Char? No, that was great. Thanks. Thanks, both. Uh, so we'll turn to Gizem uh, Ursula and MC Julie Yu from No More Later. Hello, everybody. <laughs> hey, it's really nice to meet you all on this situation after one day after the lockdown again. So I'm um, Julie and then Gizem and I are the initiator of No More Later. No More Later is an Instagram account and also an online demonstration for international art students' rights in the Netherlands. Uh, we started in the first wave of a pandemic. At that time, we we're posting memes and also like images and texts about our thinking, also kind of demanding from the institution. Um, tuition fee reimbursement and also lacking of care on the international students or lacking of accessibility. And then also housing crisis, financial crisis and then also working permit, a lot of issue. And then we do this post and we try to share info because at that time it's not easy to understand what other academy was doing. And then we are kind of like, also oh, if our school replied this, how does the other school was doing with the regulation or something? So we start this post and then people DM us. So this network start building up. We also, and, and then we start to assisting some national like uh, national scale events in, I think it was in May or June that uh, Real Velt, uh, Real Velt and then Sandberg, they hold a national alliance for all the art students and also staff or alumni. And we are discussing together about all the regulation and all the situation decision process in, in this pandemic. And then we're assisting them to, to recruit um, participant and audience. From that point, we kind of realized that if we want to solve this problem or these concerns or this unfairness or injustice, that actually we embedded already before a, a pandemic. But the pandemic just showed immediately because our situation was like as a non youth student or as a, a student who have to work a lot to sustain themselves here, we don't really have time to talk about it, but pandemic forces us to talk about it because you don't, you, can, you cannot even give your time to other work actually. So you have to talk about it. And then, but also within each academy, every, every other non youth student is really a minority. So, or international students sometimes is minority. So we need to make it a national scale. So at that point, we call out for collaborators from other schools. Now, for now, we have um, nine members from nine, five academies, five art academies in the Netherlands. We do monthly meeting, we post together, and uh, we share image um, information from each other and thinking from each other, and maybe we make posts to make an announcement. And then let me think what else. So, um, so, so, so this is how we 
um, and then now we're just trying to work as a group and see if I, we can sustain this platform and then try to give some voice or help or assist to the solidarity on the political movement. And I think Gizem now can show you something that we have done online. Hello, everybody. I'm Gizem. Uh, I think Julie pretty much gave the introduction, so I would like to share my screen and show the account to you and uh, briefly mention like how we uh, decide to make posts about and yeah. So this is our account, uh, it's no more later. You can follow it on Instagram. We are mainly active in uh, Instagram. And um, so we are speaking about like a certain issues uh, such as like, uh, and we try to make the account like a resource for the international art students in the Netherlands, because it was also uh, formed because of this reason, uh, we kind of lost uh, our trust to schools. So we felt like, okay, there should be, a way to access this information without going through like um, the like chaotic system in the school because like for example me I was um, going through a financial distress and I was contact in contact with my student counselor but at that point I realized that after wasting my three months I realized that actually he was not helping me but he was um, collecting my information and using against me by being together with the school. So like we are sharing uh, information about scholarships for non-EU students or um, like uh, some questions about how people deal with their second wave or um, some like a student crisis, like an online switch. Do we have enough uh, IT resources at home to follow the online switch? Like, do we, are, do we have a stable house? Do we have a, a stable job to maintain our studies? So like we're speaking about that, but uh, we don't have a certain like a stable structure. It also shapes through the information we get through our followers, but also with, through the crew members as well. Like uh, if we hear that our artist is increasing the tuition fees for non-EU students, then we make a post about it to increase voice and kind of creating a solidarity and a bigger crew to make pressure on the uh, schools. So after we formed the account, we started to receive a lot of uh, messages from our followers. So the account also became very interactive that people are informing about their issues to us and we make posts about it, or we receive some collaboration um, proposals from other initiatives as well. And these are the highlights that we try to keep active like uh, other two members of No More Later, Laura and Mia, for example, started care team because they realized that um, they're current students in Dutch Art Institute and they say that they have been facing or they are seeing other people facing some mental issues that uh, they, feel, they feel lonely. So every Thursday they're making um, questions and answers or give information to followers, like uh, what to do, or like what can you do in the Christmas time, like uh, where can you meet with other people or like other activities. Yeah, we also have a question and answer, like a uh, highlights that we ask questions to keep update about, okay, what's going on in each art academy? What are your current uh, difficulties? So we mainly try to keep the account uh, interactive. And this is, I think, pretty much what I can say at the moment. And later on, maybe we can provide more information. Yes. And our future plan or maybe ongoing plan is we're doing a podcast right now and it's not released 
yet, but we're doing it. And then it's um it's our goal was like to uh, sharing the student stories that's related to these conditions stems from the many political access that institution put like nationalities or even gender. And and then that, our first episode was rec rec recorded in Costco. And then we also thinking like maybe in the future, this like our other group member can also hold it in other in institution in other places because now not, not, not all of them is living in Utrecht, actually only me living in Utrecht. And then we also have other plans like um, try to, we want to try to hold another national alliance for the students or maybe for all the initiative that is rising up on social media due to all the concerns right now. And then also making collaborations, make, uh, making collaborations or maybe get supported from institution or other places. Um, we have a lot of idea to develop and also to follow on, like maybe we can make a website, maybe we can propose to other uh, group, like actually today, like today's, uh, the, the one who present today, we, I think Gizem and I work all of them before. We worked with the Vorkama before, we worked with Michi and also June before, and we worked with Yasmin before, and then so like our two main goal, one is try to sustain ourselves or maintain ourselves that that kind of that kind of mean like being still being active on the account or making build some website or other platform that can hold more message. And the other goal is like try to make collaboration or connection or like try a connection so we can actually get help each other or get mutual benefits on our project actually. Uh, so what um i think i kind of finished and then i think reason we we might actually want to propose some question to you actually so due to this lockdown this is second wave and the moment and my atmosphere really feel similar to the way when we started, like full of crisis, full of uncertainty. But like, this is second time. And then it, all, it, already, it already take us one month to actually understand how to react it or try to put action on it. So that's why normal data was started on the Instagram account. But now we kind of also don't know how to navigate or how to respond to it. And then I, I don't know if anyone have idea like related to lockdown, how can we show some support or show some solidarity immediately? Like maybe it's not immediately, but also what should we actually think or what should we actually do? And then second is like, and also like in also in this time, how can we really put some movement in the collaborate in our collaboration? Like we 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 have some proposals, um, and then but the the thing is, it's so hard to divide our labor, our time to it because all our members are voluntary based, and then um, like everyone have their own life. It's already too hard to manage your personal life, and then now there are so many ideas. On our in our group, but we don't have the resource inside at all to actually make some movement. Like if anyone, if if uh, every member is busy in making money in their personal life, they cannot give the time to this voluntary base work that much. And also sometimes it's not only about funding; it's also do we have the space? Do we have the place? Like really materially resources or. So that's what I what we are thinking about recently. First is related to the lockdown, and second is like I don't know how much we can keep going on without this feedback or without this bouncing back on the material on the support uh, resource support. You know, um, this is how actually how we want to propose to the group. Awesome. Um, I. Yeah, I have a couple of sort of things to add to that as well, but I um, maybe we can all think about that. I'll 
introduce um, Yasmin real quick, and then um, I would love to hear from you. These are fantastic questions, and I would love to hear from everyone and start the conversation that way. So thank you. Um, thank you. But just uh, briefly to take it away, uh, Yasmin Ahmed from Revolutionary IMED and International Women's Alliance. Welcome. Thanks very much, Rachel, and thanks very much to everyone else. Um, it was really great to hear about all of your work these past months um, and some great questions there, Julie, and I'm really looking forward to getting more into those. Um, as Rachel already said, I'm from Revolutionary Einheit or Revolutionary Unity in English, um, which is also a member of the International Women's Alliance, which I'm going to also talk a little bit about in um, the next few minutes. Um, so RE is a progressive youth organization um, based here in the Netherlands. Um, we operate on three points of unity, that is anti-capitalism, anti-imperialism and proletarian feminism. Um, we participate in a lot of different uh, progressive movements that are happening locally in the Netherlands, um, such as the Kikai Zwarte Piet uh, movement. We participate in housing um, movements, uh, housing rights movements, um, and all sorts of different actions that that are happening in the local um, context. We have chapters both in Amsterdam Utrecht and Rotterdam The Hague. Um, we also do a lot of internal study, um, reading, political theory and other things. We also do these on a public level and um, we're, it's also going to be our five year anniversary at the end of December and um, I just realized that we're not going to actually be able to celebrate together which is really sad um, but hadn't actually occurred to me yet. Um, so being a I was I was just talking about our activities we about our educational activities um, but really um, I think what we what RE is strongest in is our anti-imperialist work and we have a strong emphasis on our internationalist solidarity um, activities um, and this mainly is focused where we have strong um, connections which would be uh, with with the um, progressive movement in the Philippines and the Kurdish and Palestinian liberation struggles um, and we are members of the International League of People struggle and International Women's Alliance Europe. Um, obviously, yeah, we're, we're a collective, so many collectives, the basis of how they operate is meetings. Um, and obviously our meetings got very disrupted by this and Zoom has become our best friend, both for meetings, but also for webinars. And um, I wanna say that this has actually been a kind of a, a silver lining of this pandemic is um, the webinar format um, because we see opportunities that we didn't look at before for organizing and coming together on an international scale. Um, and this has worked really well um, with the international um, coalitions that we work with in, and the campaigns that we're involved with on that. Um, we also we work a lot with the Sami Dun Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network, and they've been having a lot and a lot of webinars and a lot of activities. Um, we were able to also respond when they were campaigning for Issam um, Basilat Hijawi, who is a Palestinian Scottish doctor who has been um, detained in the north of Ireland. Um, he was arrested as part of a sting operation of MI5. He is a GP, he has done absolutely nothing wrong. They're held, and um, he was on a hunger strike in September because he was being held in isolation uh, when we were able to go to the British Embassy in The Hague and uh, respond to that. And on those, um, there's been a real kind of hi hybrid, this will sound familiar to the fellows, hybrid system of, um, doing what we can in person and doing what we can online um, basically so even if you can only hold a demonstration with just a few people um, do that and it's it's a, it's a part of an international um, day of action so it's culminated in a lot of other things as well um, so we have been able to still demonstrate which is one of the most important things um, 
to be able to go out on the streets and um, for whatever reason it, it is. Um, and that was something that I think we were very worried about um, that could be an effect of this pandemic with everyone um, staying home, that, that this would be a, a reason to kind of limit our, our democratic rights. Um, but this hasn't happened and people are still mobilizing safely uh, within the lines of Corona protocol. Um, and this, this is great. There was also a demonstration today, which wasn't able to go to, but in Amsterdam in, um, regarding housing rights and the, the um, making the day shelter permanent in Amsterdam. Um, um, but I'm going to continue just talking a little bit about the International Women's Alliance and what we've been able to achieve during this time um, under these circumstances. It was a very big year for IWA. It was the 10 year anniversary and the hopes had been to um, gather together for a conference in Malaysia in November. But unfortunately, um, those hopes were dashed very early in the year. So we had to celebrate um, together online. And we did a series, a week series of webinars. We collected stories um, from around the world that was done by one of the UA member organizations. Um, just to say International Women's Alliance is made up of grassroots women's um, organizations united along anti-imperialist uh, politics um, and they are um, it is an international um, coalition um, we just launched the Europe chapter this year um, and there is also an Asia Pacific chapter and an Americas chapter um, we and we also had the we, so we had the week-long anniversary celebrations, bringing together women around the world, discussing different issues, such as how women are affected by Corona, um, how they're affected by lockdown. Um, we had um, stories about how people, how um, activists were continuing um, their particularly feminist struggles um, during this time. And we also talked a bit about political prisoners during the Europe launch because we were um, intending to launch our uh, solidarity campaign with political women political prisoners um, for EY Europe. And we did launch that campaign just um, last week with another webinar. Webin as I said, webinars have been our best friend. Um, and that um, will be continuing throughout next year. Um, the webinar, we did, we launched it, uh, we co-hosted it with Sami Dun and we were focusing on Kitam Safin, who is a Palestinian uh, woman. She is the president of the Union of Palestinian Women's Committees, and she's been um, imprisoned since early November on administrative detention, that is with no charge or no trial. Uh, we will also be highlighting cases of women political prisoners in um, Turkey, which are mostly Kurdish women, and in the Philippines. Um, so we are going to be um, working off uh, highlighting a certain case. For example, we will be talking about Amanda Chanis in the Philippines, who was recently arrested along with her newborn son. Um, and she also um, was in prison uh, with her parents when she was just two years old. Um, and we will also be focusing on Sebahat Tunsil, who is a um, Kurdish um, politician. She has also been arrested recently um, for statements that she has made um, against the government. She is a parliamentary politician. Um, and so basically, we've really had to just go to online um, to trying to convene as much as we can online and share information and um, campaign and find new ways of being together. Um, but of course, it's in a hybrid format uh, where we see where we can, um, for example, on the 25th of November was the International Day um, Against Violence Against Women and Iwa was also there. Um, and uh, in at Rotterdam, with some other women's organizations um, to mark that day, as we always do. I think the biggest um, 
difficulty for us has been um, the the time around structured meetings is also when a lot of things happen. It's where you talk about what you've been up to and more things can be born out of those things. Um, so there, and of course, like we get things like Zoom fatigue and then there's also the fact that these these platforms that we now are reliant on are run by um, companies which don't always support our causes. For example, we had a webinar shut down um, that had certain um, speakers on them, for example, Leila Khaled, um, and the webinar still happened. We, it just, we couldn't stream it. So there is a recording. I haven't seen it yet. I can't wait to see it, but there is, um, there is limitations to also having to do these things online. And at some time, we know that we will have to be able to convene again in person. Um, but the, I'll leave it there. I spoke longer than I wanted to, but thank you. That was great. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, we can we can start with some of Julie's questions. I imagine um, you've been some of you have been thinking about these things and have been thinking about these things anyway. Um, so reiterating one, which is, um, you know, now in, in, in the Netherlands, now in, you know, lockdown part two or more serious lockdown part two, um, what are we doing to, um, as resources drain, whether they're financial or emotional, um, as just, you know, how, how to sort of, how, how to maintain connections and strengths. Um, should we start with that one? Would you like to add anything to that, Julie? Sorry, I didn't catch it. <laughs> oh yeah, if just if you want to add anything to that to that question. So your question about resources, um, about resources draining now in the kind of in the second in the second lockdown round, uh, and how to how, how to go on and what are strategies, uh, uh, collectively no. or 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 individually. So this is a question for anyone. Yeah, I think it's for anyone, but I think, well, I I guess also because we just started for. Um, maybe half year around um, uh, yeah around half like eight months and then we I think we work pretty hard on it but sometimes we also need some suggestion from people who already gone through some process I think this is our main goal at, at the beginning and also the second is like also uh, uh, well actually that I was talking the second my, of my first one is actually just thinking about this lockdown, how many more, how many more people will suffer again? Like what we do, what we did, how we, what we were before, and then how can I never get this as in in my project? Actually, yes. opening it up to where people are at with any with your versions of these questions maybe a, a thought that comes to mind um not a solution oriented thought but more something i noticed that um during the first lock lockdown and i guess in the coming weeks because it's a space that uh, focuses mainly on organizing physical activities and gathering moments uh you know you can't do that so it becomes it's like okay what do you stand for then but i noticed that from thinking uh what can we then do um opportunity arrived to look more backwards in uh, archives and stories and content that was created in the past years of our activities uh, and take uh, the moment and the uh, resources to uh, document, um, uh, cherish, post, uh, publish these stories and suddenly shift a bit more uh, towards the idea of, yeah, of, of like, yeah, we spoke a lot, a lot about this in the, in the fellowship of a, of a living archive of, of uh, sharing stories, of producing content uh, in a different way. Um, and I don't mean in like commercial way uh, content, but uh, because we even our use of, so, of social media platforms was always come to this event next week hey who is coming to this new event you know in a month like this is how we used uh, our social media because that's what we were always doing always organizing events 
constantly like three times a week running running behind participation and audience and attendance and suddenly we could use our um online channels and our time and energy and and, and people to work on sharing stories on on capturing them in a, in a high quality way and using social media as a kind of a different uh, way to engage with people uh, and just to wrap up this this thoughts that this in, inspired us to start a new uh, volunteer group called uh, the four camera studio which focuses on um, documenting capturing in film and video uh, different stories or events uh, of the community but it's also a, a, a coaching and training opportunity so people who join this group learn uh, certain skills that have to do with them um, with archiving uh, and therefore can then uh, learn while volunteering or participating which is actually you know it's such a great loop um, you can you can coach people and at the same time you can create meaningful content uh, that can be then shared with a broader audience so that's just one thought that came to mind, like kind of a shift of focus and a shift of energy um, mm -hmm. during these months. And I'll, I'll follow that to also, um, Anna, you had, well, both of you had mentioned um, that you're always in process of trying to, trying to figure out how to still be doing these events or doing, you know, bringing community together, you know, in, in real time online as well. And I was just curious where, where you're at with that process. I think. For all of you, I'm, I'm very interested in knowing. Um, yeah, Yasmin touched on it a, a bit too, like how how we mobilize. So you know, a lot of a lot of online um, activities are great for reaching out to individuals, but maybe not so great uh, in in maintaining community or a sense of community. And so I want to throw that as well as a question, um, maybe starting with you, before Connor. Yeah, and I can share my screen, and you can share your thoughts. Hey. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I don't know yeah. how that happened. Uh, whoa. It's a weird format, but I guess it works now. Yeah, so for example, our Lino group was at first um, beginning in September meeting uh, only offline, as you see in the right picture on the right, uh, with a distance, but it still was working. But then suddenly uh, one Tuesday it was announced that everything has to be now um, online so in the one day before the workshop happened we had an idea of packing basically materials in small like bags you know the, the fruit bags you can buy in Albert Heijn to just put all the materials inside and then invite people to have a pickup of the material in the four camera um, we had like a certain time slot and then uh, meet us online uh, to to participate in the workshop or work um, alone and then actually we, we chose the topic um, very uh, topical. It was, was a quarantine space. So this is our piece of lino. Um, yeah, so lino is the material uh, the picture was shown before that you carve um, pieces out and then you print it. And uh, we decided to basically merge the, the circumstance we live in with the topic. And we invited people to each choose one piece of uh, cut lino uh, and take it home and take the tools and then depict something uh, that would represent their quarantine space. Um, so you can see that uh, the result was very um, dynamic. So each person, you can see, for example, the little triangle top or the swimmer, um, each person, each participant took their, um, their own piece home. And then when we came back together, um, we brought them into a poster together. So all these quarantine spaces were kind of getting together. So I think uh, in our experience, we, we needed a lot of uh, thought coming into this to organize uh, something like this um, also in an only online space, but we think that it is certainly something that we can also take for future. And just by the fact that we gave people materials, just the fact that they had them home, I think it made them feel more like they, they, they can participate than if we would just say, okay, attend this online workshop now. But um, just the fact that they really went there and showed that they had a pickup, like a pickup box kind of thing. Um, but maybe also deliveries uh, of materials would kind of contribute. And this Borders event is also just another um, result of um, one of our Lina sessions. Um, that we created a poster for another event called Perspectives that happened actually last week uh, and worked in the same way. Each participant did one piece um, and 
it all came together in the end. So I think uh, there certainly are options to make it, uh, to reorganize the ways we used to do Lino workshops uh, to now do them uh, in the lockdown in January as well, probably um, in separate physical spaces, but yeah. still coming together. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, I think the, the sense of adaptability and flexibility is then key uh, here. And, and for instance, tomorrow there was this uh, teacher's event that is organized in another space and due to the lockdown, it was just canceled. And while I do understand that and I understand how difficult it is to all the time shift and adapt your, your plans, I mean, you can go crazy from that. But yeah, I do feel like uh, organizations and groups that manage to quite quickly uh, adapt and be flexible are, are able to, um, to accommodate more of the needs of the, this moment. I have a few more examples with me of, of really what fun ways to deal with some of these questions, but maybe I'll, I'll pass it on to, to other speakers and we could hopefully share a bit more later. Oh, sounds great. I just want to comment and say that, that I really love that uh, Lino workshop, the idea of taking it home. Um, and I think that's something that like the the idea of doing something together, like a shared activity um, beyond just sitting looking at the screen is a really um, good, it's a pretty solid substitute for like what we can do at this moment. Um, in, and in terms of like connecting with your collective, like thinking of using these tools that we have like Zoom, like these online platforms in, in formats other than just meetings, like for having fun. Uh, we also did some quizzes um, on Kazoo with our E, like, and we got all our, like everyone to like send in questions and stuff and one person to put it together. Um, Cause things like these, they just, um, no, yeah, I mean, we're people, we're social beings and we we depend, we are an interdependent <laughs> species. So it's very strange for us to be in such conditions where it's dangerous to be together. Um, but thinking of, of ways that we can be online beyond just sitting kind of with each other, I think can be, especially for a new collective, um, thinking of no more later and how you want to connect with, um, the the people who are who you're who are in your collective or platform who, who the people who need it like um maybe launching some kind of online activity to to get people together to to get to know each other um and it can be a, around a certain activity to make it less awkward because that can be very strange adapting to this and you know you also don't want to I think keeping it in a good time frame is also important because uh, staying too long on your screen can be tiring. Yeah. Uh, I've seen, I've worked with Julie and Bizem uh, before, and I believe in your creative capabilities. They're very artistic people. And uh, I, I just saw what you did. You just came up with the, with the presentation for the International Women's Day that would be on December 18, right? And uh, I think it's allowed that three people can be together outside or two for now. So I, you, you could do like what you did the other day, like um, doing a, a theater presentation uh, using visual like mask and uh, wearing costumes and telling stories of what you did, like telling stories of migrants. And I think it's very important to develop now the educational component of uh, like uh, we, we can educate migrants and also our host governments and also the people from the parliaments and, and, the, and uh, the people we need to go to for help uh, using our creative. There are many creative ways and means to do that. So one is to sit there, one is way to play, one is puppetry, and then we can show it online. But I guess I, I don't know if I understood Julie correct, but um, the question is also more like how in this type of care uh, structures, we often forget ourselves. So how um, a vulnerable body and mind can 
put effort on this kind of collectives or initiatives. Like um, we, we too created this uh, platform when we were student and we were about to graduate. And uh, actually it was um, chaos and it was so difficult to handle with it. But at the same time, like we were the only ones not like um, only students, but it's like, if we don't do it, if a student doesn't do it, then another person cannot do it because they don't know about it, you know? I mean, right now we are alumni and we don't know about the current uh, student problems. So a student has to inform us about it. So it has to come from a student hand, but at the same time, that student, like other members in our crew, for example, they are going through like a massive difficulties, you know, they try to maintain their studies, they try to fight with the housing crisis, they, fight, they try to fight with the financial problems, they cannot work, they don't have access to many fundings, and they still have to like, have the feeling of fighting for this, but how? Because it is very difficult to find this energy. So the point is like, okay, how can we maintain this kind of platforms or initiatives, collectives? This is my question. <laughs> yeah, I, I maybe want to echo that and add a little bit too, also to um, Charlie and Gerardo at Mutual Support is thinking about how the school structure um, almost uh, tries to foreclose, um, you know, ongoing ongoing knowledge about these issues or organizing by being, you know, it is a short term the student cycle out. And I admire uh, all, you know, all, all four of you uh, talking about kind of exceeding your time at the school, like thinking about how to how to stay on and maybe for a short time or, and pass it on. But I'm I'm curious about about those strategies that you're thinking of to um, to maintain these networks and these and these knowledges to uh, on to, to you know next next generations of students next years of students. So what are some structural things you're thinking of? Yes, thank you, Rachel. Yeah, indeed, um, and I think this also speaks a lot about the the, the work that we have been doing with. Um, uh, that we did with the fellowship in relation to the uh, uh, to uh, the living archive, which, which was mentioned by uh, by Shai already. So, and this is also um, so there there are several things, of course. But then, um, on one hand, and I think this also speaks with what uh, 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 Gisem was speaking of. So, and and Michi. So this this idea of of uh, of bringing stories together as a way of um, of kind of strengthening and and sort of like a, a, um, producing like a like a like a body that can be shared in a sense um, of 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 knowledge, no. But then um, so then there is this idea of, of of archiving and the living archive, which has to do with with really keeping keeping up with a with an archive as a way of connecting with people. So then um, uh, so then there is this kind of a continuous flow of uh, of stories that can be in this case. Um, Perhaps in the in the case of uh, that, that uh, Gisem was speaking, I think it also speaks with uh, many of the struggles that uh, that well, you know, we 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 experienced also uh, uh, at the masters um, and all the all the work that was done. But then, so if uh, personal stories are brought together in this relationship with institutions, for instance, and with uh, conditions of uh, of living and and uh, and hardship of. Uh, 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 surviving in the Netherlands as a as a non EU, but also as a as a EU um, non Dutch speaker, perhaps also complicates things. Um, so so ways of of bringing these stories together, perhaps this 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 can can really do something as well. And I think it's a great idea, of, like of of this this idea of Michi of like sort of like activated with a with a kind of a. a, a visual uh, resources and things like this so this on one hand and on the other hand so then there is the, the there is the um the oh, which by the way i also wanted to 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 mention that the that the linoleum was amazing like this uh, this engraving i thought it was very beautiful and because i think and in relation to also what jasmine was speaking of with like um sort of the ability that zoom has of or this 
uh, online platforms to bring people that are uh, elsewhere together um, that are non non local let's say so then this also I think sort of uh, works out very well for uh, platforms like the no more later and also for the for the uh, MSP I think so as a way of really bringing people together but then there is this this need of like activating things materially so I think the lean the lean oil was really beautiful in that because like to to get this feeling of like mobilization or something like uh, so and then I think in regard to this uh, uh, the the MSP should be also thinking of uh, materially speaking like how to how to come together with something but then just to answer to you uh, Rachel uh, uh, quickly so we we just have like a, a this, these two main groups right now of work, which are the institutional injustice work, which is in relation to all these injustices, uh, so with the state, but also with the, with the, with the HKU, and with the state, I mean with the, with the uh, here committee and this kind of uh, institutions that protect people to be uh, uh, unjust, unjustifiedly uh, uh, sort of kicked out or, or uh, um, yeah, so problems with with rents, and then also ways of sustaining practice. But also, um, so how how do you articulate your practice as a a loop, as a student or as an artist or as a uh, in relation to the conditions that, that you're in? So then also as a way of sort of like putting these things together. No? So I don't know if Charlie wants to add something to that. Yeah, also another thing that came up recently um, for the mutual support platform. Um, because we've been um, the last few months trying to reach out to alumni that graduated before us um, is I think like one, maybe one method of kind of um, gaining support for oneself and like helping oneself in uh, this like fatigue and stress that some are experiencing uh, more than others. Um, we found that a few alumni seem to have, or it happens to be a few alumni, but some people who have reached out to us to be part of the mutual support platform have, have, st have said that they have more energy and they have the energy and they're really excited to be part of the mutual support platform. So I think this is also maybe one other thing, which it's difficult to just find people who have the energy to help you. But I think sometimes this could work where, um, like for example, if um, within the mutual support platform, if the students are under a lot of stress and difficulty right now and don't have the energy, then we can find a few people within the network who do have energy. So maybe this kind of like teaming up of people who have different amounts of energy and resources to help each other. Yeah, can I just add on that? I think it's very important what I find uh, nice in the forecomer that we have one central person who basically takes care of volunteers, who's the project coordinator and then organ um, her name is Salma and she really organized um, these meetups of volunteers um, that work in the forecomer to just update ourselves on what we're doing. And for me, that was very valuable in September that we saw each other like kicking off and even if a lot of them actually, unfortunately, didn't come back um, during the fall because not many activities were happening, I thought it was really nice to see that people still have motivation to be part of the Forecomer volunteer community. Um, but maybe the second point I had more for um, for Julie and Gizem is like, um, I'm wondering though if it's it's really a big struggle that that you can't be paid for working on uh, on those issues, especially because these are issues that are concerning financial stuff as well, probably. And I'm wondering if you've already contacted an organization called ELSA in Utrecht, that is like um, European um, European Law Associations of Students, European Student, yeah, European Law Association, because I feel like th that organization is all uh, also volunteer based because there are students working for free but they are just not involved in arts area, but rather involved in the law area. And since they work with European law uh, and are studying towards that, it might be a challenge for them to address um, the issues you face. And I feel like if you, if you go out, maybe you already contacted them, but I feel like this kind of like collaborations between groups that don't necessarily fit together, uh, but can aid, um, like mutually help each other would be something we should strive for. Uh -huh. Oh, can I have the name of the organization? Like how to spell it? 
and I'm actually also, there's also a thing immediately when you say European um, organization because our group there's only like two European in our group so there's not much if the but I mean we can definitely check and then see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's just European law. Yeah, the ah. European law, Student Association. So they know the European law that you should know. And then yeah. maybe you do something mutually for them back. Maybe they need a cool logo design. And yes, yes. In Hakau, yeah. I'll send it to you. Thank you. Also, like we, um, through DM again, like we contacted one, like uh, a law student, for example, and uh, she helped us to understand the the latest NRC article about the uh, uh, sexual um, abuse in within the institutions. So like we are actually contact with the people, but um, it is just difficult to maintain. And uh, you kind of have the burden of also asking someone to do another volunteer work, which takes a lot of time and effort of that person as well. Like, um, I find it quite nice, for example, when Michi mentioned our um, perf street performance that we did last year, and this year we have another thing, but I will keep it as a surprise. Um, we had a puppet walk performance, and um, like for this kind of things, for example, we can always contact a basic activist kitchen and ask them to provide food, for example. This is uh, also quite big, actually, that the initiatives are helping each other or um, because we all have we all have like a different uh, way but somehow we can meet at some point and although like it might seem like a, a small contribution from outside that like okay just providing a sandwich to the performance but actually is not something small it's quite big so this kind of communication chains actually I was talking about, like how can we support each other, these initiatives based on, based on their um, profession, you know? Uh, how can we support each other and help each other to maintain these platforms? Yeah, I actually wanted to, to add on, on two points that I think are really interesting. One, the use of the notion of energy um, which Charlie addressed because I, I find myself going back to that now a lot because it's you know it's been a while so you are you have ups and downs and it's a flow of of moments and um, I see how a lot of people that were very active uh, in their voluntary work um, in the forecomer and around uh, have lost their energy and and even when there could be uh, events to attend uh, much less people come even when it's possible and there's kind of a I guess sort of a you know a communal uh, fatigue but also with a sprinkle of laziness and it's kind of easier now to stay home as well or it's you know also a bit scary so you rather stay home so on one hand there is this huge loss of energy that that I think just we feel how it feels like work of years is kind of um well, I don't want to sound very dramatic, but it feels like a lot of things need to be built again. Uh, on the other hand, what I thought is quite interesting is, is people in educational programs, um, so students that still need to continue their education, they still need to have uh, an internship or a work experience place, uh, approach uh, us in the forecomer. And now we kind of started thinking, okay, so someone is doing an internship, then we directly think of them or uh, encourage them to also be active participants of the community. So not only doing like backstage tasks, but also uh, actively join work groups. And this is something we didn't consider so structurally before because we didn't have the need because there were enough people active. Um, but now every person who's doing an internship or a research project within the forecomer with their energy because they, you know, they want to complete their studies is an active member of a project group and bringing that energy that they have driven by their, their, their need and their wish to continue uh, their study as planned uh, has really helped uh, with bringing kind of fresh um, circulation. And then uh, the other point that uh, Gizem was mentioning about collaboration, um, which is I think a really important one and I'll quickly share an uh, image because it's fun. Um, but this is uh, 
so, so our initiative is, is, is located in a specific space, but it's a small indoor space. And during the summer, uh, we found ourselves having the opportunity and the need to collaborate with different spaces in the city, uh, back at the Nijverheide and Raam. Um, and before that, it was hard to see how can we collaborate because we have a space and you or they or uh, have a space. So you, you see yourself as like, sometimes it's like islands in the city wanting to do their own program, attract their own audience, uh, get traffic coming in and, and a full program. But during the pandemic in the summer, a lot of uh, shared spaces were emerging. So we did our programs in other places, uh, which were also really happy to have a program because everything was canceled. Festivals, performances, everything was canceled. So it was a mutual way to collaborate uh, that uh, prior to this seemed to be uh, missing. Like, what is the common ground? So I really hope that a more multi-local approach between spaces of, okay, it doesn't all have to be in our house, but how do we share spaces, share programs, share uh, resources? I really hope that that would stay so that we could continue hopping out and in, in between spaces more as a network rather than, you know, islands that are uh, programming inside um, their own little active space. Jasmine, were you going to say something? Yes, I was. I'm just trying to remember what it was. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just kind of, um, with regarding like No More Later and Mutual Support Platform, like you are specifically targeting your, your struggles kind of against institutions. Um, and um, just to, to note that like, you know, it's always a difficulty when you're doing unpaid work and for for myself with re and you are like and i'm sure for many activists it's it's all unpaid work and um i think that it would be it would be great for you guys because you're indirect like you're directly like trying to deal with these institutions which is the only time like when i come into contact with, with these institutions for events and stuff is when there can be some like subsidy some some payment and stuff so i think i come from quite a different um background in that sense in that um even before when i lived in london as an activist i just did vol volunteer work in the, um, the feminist library um and just relating it to energy and stuff i think what what you really need to work on is your conviction and your belief in the work that you're doing because i think you can draw a lot of energy from yourself if you believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing i know that sounds very um it's very like a motivational speech but it's very true um and i think that you guys are have great plans and i think that maybe we can have a another meeting with some of the people gathered here and some others that isn't a webinar and we can really talk about how do how do we move forward like let's set some meetings let's let's have some discussions around this because i mean it's really important also for those who have more experience in building organizations to pass on that knowledge and support those who are just starting out so um i just want to say that um yeah if you have any questions if you want to have a meeting if you want to talk about possibilities and ways forward i'm completely here for you for you guys like i really i i really think that you guys are doing a great job um and yeah i think we should really uh support support see how we can support this i i wanted to um everyone has had a little bit of a chance to talk about um kind of how, how to structurally deal with um like how to organize and um let people have certain voices and have certain care i was wondering michi how um how migrante utrecht is is um is organized in a way like how how do you stay with so many different different you know different fires different um different networks of support um how, how does the group how does the group organize and how do you deal with kind of like caring for each other um as a co collective process. Yeah, actually, we work on common issues. 
like uh yes uh if you would like to um uh address the issues and concerns of let's say uh the undocumented then we collaborate with uh on commun uh, undocumented communities and organizations and we do some brainstorming on how to uh, um, help out so that's one and uh we use creative forms like uh, in organizing communities and uh, organizations and um, like we do workshops and it depends on the interests also and needs of the of the group. So let's say um, we want to mobilize the youth. So what is their interest? So let's say uh, they're interested in uh, visual arts. So we give them a uh, let's say um, mass making workshop or puppetry or painting or yeah so we have a lot of uh, uh, a lot of creative means uh, ways to to mobilize people mobilize and organize but of course the 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 most important um, point of this uh, activities is that you would like to raise the awareness of the people in the struggles of uh, of the of the migrants, of the communities that we're working with. So, did I answer the question? Or? Um, yeah, in, term, and in terms of kind of how to keep how to keep energy up, I'm also curious how you organize, like maybe in a more kind of basic way. You know, how how do you organize yourselves? How do you make decisions and you know decide decide what to focus on and that kind of thing? Is it all totally collective or? It's always collective. Like uh, we hold regularly uh, a study groups, study uh, group discussions, and we analyze. Uh, especially, uh, we are now. Um, we would like to address the the how to call it. There is a need of solidarity to address the the, the development urgencies. Uh, like now we are experiencing outright uh, fascism and um, and the dictatorship is the um, we have a full blown dictatorship happening in our country. That's one. So we need to gather and uh, and uh, uh, we need to to study. We need to to talk about these issues and then and then reach out and uh, reach out to uh, how just develop develop um, develop um, ways on how to educate and how to uh, raise the consciousness of people. So what we do, yes, it's just like what we do, we, we go we do house calls, uh, we go to houses of migrants and educate them. And we also uh, do webinars. Uh, we hold uh, like forum or uh, we hold little little uh, group. Which is we uh, organize small groups and we give workshops. We draw out from them their experiences and then until we come up with uh, something to to discuss uh, these issues. And we yeah. And finally, there's always this uh, call to for a concrete action and it, it has to come from them yeah fair I want to ask if there are questions among um, among all of the guests for each other um, otherwise I'll keep going but I would love to open it up for any of you to kind of cross cross pose as well Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering. Um, so, and I was thinking a little bit with what um, what Chai was speaking of uh, in relation to the to the um, to the interns working with uh, directly with uh, working groups and uh, that are involved with a with a community, and also with what uh, uh, Jasmine so generously uh, um, offered. 
to to us to the MSP to no more later. Um, so I was thinking in relation to these two uh, uh, things, and um, so one on on one hand the sort of the possibility of uh, of having somebody that you, having somebody around like so just me coming in in into a meeting let's say and then sort of like sharing a little bit uh, uh, uh knowledge on on so the 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 internal works of uh, of uh, of becoming a, a, a collective in a sense and because you know the the msp really works in the basis of like the work that is brought in right so if somebody brings work uh, um, like uh, like an initiative and needs something, then that something gets activated and it's like this. But then, sort of like to to get from her a little bit of a, so that that would be fantastic. And then I was also thinking with uh, uh, with the four camera with with what Shai was saying, sort of like this also as a as an infrastructure that can sort of allow. Um, uh, people to to find ways of grounding their work you know like to to really uh, uh, have uh, fight this uh, uh, sort of strange idea of, of becoming artist in this sort of fantastic way but really to sort of like um, exchange basically knowledge for uh, for just you know work and creativity or something like uh, so the, to to sort of um, how can we take this uh, further maybe and you know, also channel it with a with a, uh, with a, a master of fine arts, perhaps, and sort of things like this. But then, so that on one hand, and on the other hand, the infrastructure that sort of like getting the the this this kind of knowledge would just mean. So, like, I was thinking on this on this. So if maybe somebody wants to answer. Yeah. No. I, I mean, I think it's it's really interesting to think how. Um, as a, as, a, as a student and an artist, you can position yourself on one hand as a as a maker and on the other hand as a participant. Um, and what does that mean to to navigate between both positions? So uh, I relate that to almost monthly questions that we get from uh, students that are doing their research about the topic of migration, which is a very uh, relevant topic at the moment. Um, but there is something, and I myself define myself as a researcher, so I'm aware of that, but there is something very one-sided about the idea of um, researching uh, in order to you know, get the information that you need to write a great thesis. Uh, so I'm, I'm asking myself and, and, and thinking along with the, the, no, the notion of infrastructure and getting organized, what does it mean to be on one hand a researcher or a maker or a student, on the other hand an active participant and a member of the community and, and can you do both and, and how does that uh, enrich spaces and places and how does that enrich your your own study and I feel like with with time and even more these days that notion of the participator the community builder as an artist as a researcher uh, has become more and more important and and, and exciting actually uh, as a strategy um, so for sure I'm sure there are many ways to to ground that in in a in a, in a certain structure with a, with a master program and, and other programs, yeah, definitely. Um, I might take this to move a bit to the topic of study. I was thinking, Yasmin, when you you mentioned that, I guess since the more since the lockdown time, you started uh, engaging in study groups. Um, and this may be something I've seen a lot more with activist groups that not that we necessarily have more time, but there's there's been this, um, I think because of this webinar dominance, um, there's there's just been this kind of, this, this, up, this upsurge of doing, of meeting together in this way of doing these reading groups and um, thinking together groups. And um, I was also just thinking about that in the context, of course, of, of two of the groups here coming from universities. And I know also, um, Michi, as I understand you're doing uh, and this also comes from a question from the chat, but um, that with Mirante, you're doing study groups as well. That with the um, with the, the migrant community here um, in Utrecht, uh, you're also performing study groups. There's a question for me or for this this 
is for me. It's for kind of for both, but for you, maybe for you yeah. to start would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we always have the study groups. Uh, we have collectives. So I uh, like, let's say, uh, we, we, because we, our house got burned, so we, we stayed in an office. And of course, there are some people in the office also living there. And so we formed a collective. And so, so during this time of pandemic, we uh, developed these uh, regular study groups. And yes, we get the, so we, um, we uh, take a look at what are the urgent issues, or what are the burning issues, and we analyze, we study, and then we, we try to brainstorm on how to like, make concrete actions on like, uh, if it's going to be a campaign, and do we do, shall we organize webinars to, to inform people, or shall we hold workshops, or things like this. So, yeah. And then not only in our collective inside the office, but also like we form also collectives like uh, undocumented uh, uh, friends. Like uh, we ask them if what if we uh, discuss these topics and go on online. So we have this also. And so we also have this uh, migrant uh, organization here in Uchek. We call it 3K, uh, but it's in Filipino. The three words, it's Kababayan Kaibigan Kaisa. And um, oh, we noticed that uh, we haven't heard from them, of course, and more so uh, we try to gather them. And then we had this uh, like, uh, I don't know how you, you say it in English, but it's like, it's, we say, we say kamustahan. it's an activity like we want to know what's, how they're doing. And then after that, we try to like what we, we, we wanted to know what they would like to have, even if it's just an online activity, just to keep us together. And then uh, somebody uh, uh, suggested that we have a Christmas party online. So instead of, uh, you know, gathering together, we just um, bake or cook food and we eat together. And then we do some, you know, sometimes before, before without, uh, I mean, before COVID hit us, uh, we, we hold games. And then so we said, why not try games online? and also like giving out Christmas wishes. So we're trying to still um, uh, brainstorming on that. We wanted to do it, but still we're, plan we're planning it. Uh, I mean, uh, we'll do it. So that's one. And uh, yeah, I think, uh, and then we have this ongoing uh, activity, like we wanted to have regular uh, uh, mobilizations, mass actions, but then, uh, we are trying to design how we're going to do it, like really uh, studying, because we've been doing it, like uh, Gerardo, Yasmin, and some fellows, they already attended this, and we always hold this in a, a whole catarine, right? And um, so, but this time it's because it's limited, so we are trying to trying to design how we, it would, like, would look like it's just three people, three people, but still hold this kind of activities, so. Yeah. But uh, the, the, the study groups is online and not online, but uh, we keep our distance, of course. And maybe I'll just continue with talking about the study. Study groups are something that we've also done before COVID, um, but it's become more of something that we can continue. Um, and it's actually quite difficult because right before in, um, I think it was in, in February, we had um, a public study session um, by where one of our members was leading a discussion on commodity fetishism, which 30 people attended, which is pretty good for a very, very heavy Marxist kind of theoretical discussion. Um, and we were really looking forward to having more of those kind of gatherings, um, but they haven't happened yet. We did have one last week, um, an educational discussion on um, Anton de Combe's book, Why Vice Slavery Night in Suriname. Um, and I have to say that like, as, so how we, how we usually would do it would be to have someone select uh, a reading, um, 
that they will then lead the discussion on. Um, but we are now trying to figure out like for the for the last one we had, we're, we're trying to make it more structured because we can't come together to give people more support like before the actual um, event itself, like um, questions to think of and, and some guiding um, support for it. Um, but in general, like, yes, it, indeed, there's been a huge, I think, upsurge in like online learning gatherings um, in this time. And I think that even all of the webinars that have happened are an educational resource. Um, for example, like I mentioned Sammy doing earlier, but also the ILPS and so many like progressive organizations are regularly having these uh, webinars. And there's just this incredible catalog online now of all of this knowledge that is accessible, so, like, as long as you have a computer and an internet connection, there is just an incredible amount of knowledge that has been built online during this time from across the world. And after the pandemic, it's gonna be quite a task to, to, some, to try and like bring that stuff together because it is all really amazing. We've had, we've had um, like, yeah, forums with, with people like Angela Davis with, uh, young organizers now um, are happening and these kind of this, but like so many of them. Um, so it's, it's really incredible. And I think it will be it like, I don't know who's going to take on the task of um, gathering all those and putting them in some kind of webinar library, but uh, <laughs> maybe some people here can work on it. <laughs> I think okay. So, so may, I add some, may I add something? Because I remember uh, now I'm watching Yasmin. Uh, we also have this uh, school, online school, uh, because uh, most of our migrant members uh, and undocumented members uh, still doesn't know how to, still they, uh, what is, they don't know how to speak the language. And uh, so we're having this TAL less, uh, you know, less Dutch lessons. And I remember because yes, we we, uh, we were getting a lot of help from your group, Revolutionary Ein High, because they, they facilitate our our this school language school, and then we integrate it with the issues what's happening, and then we of course uh, we we learn we, we formulate sentences, and then we discuss issues using the language uh, lessons. So that's one also. Um, another question from the chat, and maybe this is in kind of partial closing also, we have uh, about 15 minutes left. Um, so the question for, for any of you is more about uh, direct emergencies or urgencies. So maybe what are things that are most urgent for you right now? And or what do you need the most? Mm, there's one point that is yeah, somewhat building on that question, but I just really want to bring that on. Um, so it's not necessarily direct need, but um, it's an important thought I feel that uh, I would like us to take from this period further. Um, and that's uh, echoing the question of, of, of impact and, and success measures or however we define it. So, you know, uh, many social initiatives and cultural spaces uh, are obliged to measure their um, relevance uh, by numbers, so how many people attend uh, an event like this, how many people come to an exhibition, uh, how many people come to an activity, how many volunteers you have, you know, any uh, quantitative measures. And even when we um, had a discussion with one of the funds that support us uh, about uh, the coming period and that we take in mind that the event that we will have um, won't have uh, dozens of people visiting even so we still got the question to prove uh, or to uh, argue uh, the numbers of people and how we will grow within the next years and uh, what I'm really hoping and I guess that's what I think we need and, and a lot of uh, type of initiatives like that need is to argue for the notion of qualitative, interactive, intimate uh, gatherings and intimate spaces 
where uh, your impact or your relevance or your success uh, is really no longer measured with how many people physically attend your space. And now you can't have many people because it's not allowed, but you still requested to say how much will you grow in visitors uh, or, or volunteers, you know, and that's just, I had to think about it. Like in the past years, we had big events with 60, 80, 100 people. And then I have to think, but did these people talk to each other? Because when there's 100 people, then it's really hard to have a qualitative, intimate, uh, one on one, uh, comfortable discussions or interactions or long lasting relations. So, uh, can we now uh, shift to thinking of uh, social impact and success and relevance of? such spaces and institutions and organizations beyond the notion of numbers and how many people come and more towards the quality of the events the the intimacy the um relationships that grow uh, and so on so maybe it's not a direct need but i'm really hoping that uh, funds and, and and policymakers and lobbyists would be able to uh, come up with other um, ways to measure and understand uh, impact or however we want to call it which lean on you know things that have to do with small gatherings and and qualitative interactions yeah i'll go uh, next then um i completely agree with what you're saying shy i think that it's um there, there isn't much meaning in numbers, but there is a lot of meaning in everything else that happens in an, in an event. And I kind of said a similar thing earlier when in regards to demos, like it's um, it's it's important that these things happen because of the, the reason that they're happening and the context, not not just to have a lot of people there. Um, and to more specifically answer your question, um, Rachel, I about needs and urgencies i mean that's a that's a very difficult one because we've been in this situation for so long um i want to say vaccine <laughs> i just need everyone to be vaccinated so we can all <laughs> be together again and uh, have a hug <laughs> um but be beyond that i i don't i don't feel the the urgencies or the the kind of crisis um that was felt in the first lockdown um i think this is for a lot of reasons um because kind of know what to expect because there's also a vaccine now that will be um started to be disseminated in this country very soon um so i think um and and also just yeah we've we've been here before and and we also were expecting we knew that this was going to happen um where it was just a matter of when the government would actually implement it um i think um i think the biggest the biggest need is for us to just keep continuing and persevering um and that really is a collective effort and i think just to stay connected in whatever ways we can is a fundamental thing so that we can just get get to the the next point um because there's always things on the list then the list is very long of things to do so um perseverance is we we need a, a bottomless bucket of perseverance and and emotional agility yeah i will build a top on that because that's that's just very well said i think what we urgently need now is also a platform for some sort of positive news because everyone is very overwhelmed uh, with the numbers and just this is just a general thought i think um so so to provide and disseminate like positive news about what's happening either in our collective like like Shai said, like sharing stories um, of what we've been ach achieving so far, um, but also yeah, to keep up this energy um, flowing around and also not focusing only on Corona, but like on random news. So we can use the platforms that we, we have and we own either like social media platforms or just 
people we know to to just share that there are also good things happening however idyllic or new topic that sounds yeah and then to just add to that like i think what we need is that uh, we we people we keep on showing up you know like i'm, I'm so appreciative that uh, anna you still organize a um, couple of activities and and people that, that uh, still find the energy and the motivation uh, to organize or or to come uh, physically or online so that we show up <laughs> that we come that we participate that we engage um so it doesn't feel like all the work is kind of dissolving into the quarantine space but that there's still uh action space and people that want to be uh together that's i think so deeply needed Anyone else final thoughts on, on further needs or pressing matters? Yeah, also for the mutual support platform. Um, I mean, I think, especially considering entering into the second lockdown, um, I think, yeah, echoing what everyone else is saying that showing up for each other and finding out what are in what ways do people need support now? In what ways do the student need support? In what ways do the alumni need support? Um, but also perhaps another need is um, trying to get some, um, trying to enter into a conversation with the institution. Um, this is something that we tried in the first lockdown and it was not successful. So I think perhaps um, now that the students are entering into this second wave of being online and not having enough support. Um, I think this is possibly, I mean, this is definitely a need. Um, so I think, yeah, the mutual support platform showing up for the people within the network. And any, any further comments or I will, I will start to say thank you and wrap it up. Um, I want to, first of all, thank our funders, <laughs> the Dutch Ministry of Education, Culture and Science and the City Council Utrecht. Um, and the two people currently really, um, well, three people currently uh, running the fellowship, uh, Sanna Kaffenberg, Rena kallebach Rome, and Jana Van Hieswick. Um, and then for, especially for uh, the work put into tonight, uh, Hedda Van Gurning and June Saturday, all from Bach. Uh, I would like to thank all of you for, for joining us here uh, on the Zoom and out on the live stream. And um, I want to tell you, I want to ask you to take care and um, take care of each other. And um, I'll sign off and see you all in, in various online and, and, and real spaces post post vaccine soon. Thank you.